working. That's working. Uh, so we use the speakers from the computer. Oh, this one totally dead? Uh, well, it appears to have been enough to, to, to take the... Or we'll, we'll turn it on and see. But no, the battery look, looks okay. Okay. Yes. Can you just place that one beside that one? If you see uh, this setting here, do you yeah, have was that with the, it wasn't showing anything, so... No, okay. Have you more than one option there now? Mm. On that bar? I have to find the mouse first. There it is. Uh, no, and, and that's the same as... So it's just seeing its own speakers. Well, so it only sees its own speakers, and, and when it goes in there, it yeah. doesn't... It doesn't do anything. Off. So we, we'll take, take that out, because it's, it's non-functional. So I'll try the Skype. Course test again. Yeah. Hello, welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. Is it there? There's a microphone. Yeah. The, there's the speaker. Uh, the speaker is on the side. The microphone is on the the webcam. Yeah, this is up here. No. Okay, Dan. Yeah, there's the microphone. There's the speaker. 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 You don't need to do it like. So you need to put it. No, I don't want to bend it too much. No, no, no. We, we, we there we have it. This place is there. Well, we don't want to rest it on because it's going to vibrate. But something like that? Try, try that. Hello, welcome to Skype call testing service. After the beep, Please record a message. Afterwards, your message will be played back to you. Uh, this is a message which is being played back to me. <laughs> it's, it's not connected to no. the it's, it, well, uh, well, uh, it's This is a message which is being played back to me. He's muted something on the side. He's a little bit to put it out, but he kept muting something. If you are able to hear your own voice, then you have configured Skype correctly. If you hear this message, but not your own voice, then something is wrong with your audio recording settings. Please check your microphone and microphone settings, or visit Skype.com for more help. Thank you for using the Skype call testing service. Goodbye. So this is this is the mic to to, to speak into. So you sit there. I sit, I sit here and try and manage things. There's a there's a there's a plug here. And can we watch it on the slide? Jonathan's slide? Is he going to? Yeah. But then I, is he going to? Uh, he's going to. I'm going to Skype him now. Right. Is he going to present as well? Uh, yes. But he can't see the slides. Well, okay. Because you don't have to see them, there are very few. Yes, we're here. Excellent. It's just we're not quite sure who's here. This this is Ed, sir. Hi. This is Robert hey. Lasbury, and I'm here, and uh, you're uh, about to go 
full screen on one of the screens in our room. No. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, this is Jonathan Greenberg. He's in Champaign, Illinois, and he's the author of two. He, he's the author of two packages, and we're going to try and do this so that Jonathan is going to talk. Uh, uh, talk us briefly through five or six slides that he made for a recent roundtable on big data in parallel. That's where we start, and then the panel will contribute sort of, at this time of day in Norway, it's late, everybody's been working hard all day, so it won't, it, it won't be very enlightening, but at least it may be amusing. Okay, so Jonathan, I, I have your first slide up. You can, you, you, you can maybe see the corner of a slide here, but you won't be able to tell which one it is. We're on slide one. Oh, okay. The, just the title slide? It's just the title slide. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, hello, everybody. So, uh, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, greetings from Illinois. Um, so, I thought I'd just really quickly talk about some of my efforts and then uh, talk about what I think we kind of need and the open source GIS kind of related to big data. So, if you can, I guess, go to... to uh, well, just a quick background. I'm a uh, assistant professor in uh, the Department of Geography and GI Science at the University of Illinois. Um, if you're not familiar with my university, um, we are one of the big uh, supercomputing campuses uh, in the U.S., so we've got some of the largest machines in the world. We actually invented the web browser. That's the uh, big claim to fame of the university, at least the engineering department. But anyway, um, so I guess if you go to the first slide, or the next slide, and I'm going to kind of follow along. Yep, next slide. Okay. Um, so just to give you a quick background, I guess, on my research and what got me into this was, uh, I'm interested, are we on the some background slide? Yes. All right, great. Uh, so my background is in plant climate interactions and remote sensing science. Um, I teach R primarily in a programming for GIS course here that's always booked. Um, it's usually about a third grad students, two thirds undergrads. Um, I spend about half the class teaching them how to use R as a programming lang language using uh, Norm Matloff at UC Davis's uh, great textbook, and then the other half is uh, Roger, your textbook, and uh, uh, for the GIS part. And then I also uh, do a little bit of R programming in both an introductory and uh, more in an advanced remote sensing class. And as you mentioned, I'm, a, I'm the developer of two packages up on CRAN, so I don't know what that says. Uh, spatial tools and GDAL utils, and I'll talk really briefly about spatial tools today. Uh, next slide. Um, so just to give you just a brief background and why I'm using this, I'm using uh, both remote sensing to derive vegetation response surfaces and then using uh, climate predictor surfaces like WorldClim uh, and fusing the two together to do this comprehensive landscape scale analyses of plant interactions with climate. Uh, next slide. Um, so how does this interface with big data? Well, as most of you know, that climate and remote sensing data sets are getting uh, much, much larger. Um, so spatial resolution, spectral resolution, temporal resolution uh, are improving on a monthly or daily basis. So just as a, an example, a uh, recent paper in, what was it, Science, what was it, Nature, uh, last year um, that uh, Hansen et al. published uh, was looking at uh, def global deforestation, and they used um, 654,000 Landsat images. So this was in collaboration with Google to produce uh, the most complete and, and spatially resolved uh, map of deforestation ever created. And those Landsat images, when you download them from the USGS, are about one and a half gigabytes each, just to give you an idea of how much data. Uh, and we're not at that scale, but we are moving towards uh, probably in the next year, I'll be doing about a quarter petabyte analysis uh, using uh, LIDAR and other remote sensing data sets. Uh, next, oh, uh, and uh, before switching, and along with this, the algorithms for processing these data sets are getting much more computationally costly. In remote sensing, uh, we love random forest. We use GAN and GLMs all the time, uh, various machine learning algorithms. So we're getting larger data sets and more computational analyses that we need to perform on them. So next slide. And this will kind of set up, I guess, some of the topics maybe of discussion and some of the challenges I see. Um, one of the first things, and this is not to insult uh, the audience there, but many of the end users of GIS and remote sensing uh, are not proficient in big data processing. A lot of us get into GIS and remote sensing not through computer science, but we come through it through environmental sciences or other aspects. Um, but we're obvious candidates for needing uh, to, be, uh, to be able to process big data. 
Um, most existing GIS software, as you're, most of you are familiar with, particularly on the vector side, uh, has very limited or completely absent support for high-performance computing and parallel processing. Raster processing, uh, there's more support uh, for parallel processing, but vector processing is very rare, rarely uh, parallel or big data ready uh, in pretty much all GIS platforms. Um, and then another challenge is that a lot of the analytical techniques, at least on the remote sensing side, are, are initially developed for non-geospatial relatively small data sets. And a lot of times, a lot of these techniques are developed first in R, widely used first in R, random forest being another good example of that. Uh, next slide. So just one of the functions I've helped in, one of the issues was that I've got, uh, I'm an assistant professor, just started my tenure process, I've only been at University of Illinois a couple of years. I've got grad students and I don't want them spending two years learning how to parallel process their one data set, but they have these giant data sets uh, and I don't want to be hearing the excuse of, well, the thing's processing while they're, you know, going out for coffee for three days. Um, so uh, I developed this uh, infrastructure uh, building on uh, raster, uh, the raster package. And the goal was uh, this function is part of spatial tools called raster engine. Was, so really my primary goal was the bar of entry for performing primarily pixel and focal window-based processing of raster files using arbitrarily complex models uh, being able to use it on various parallel infrastructures, either single machine, multi-core uh, machines, or larger cluster computers, which we have, I have access to, uh, in parallel with memory management. Um, and of course, uh, and Raster Engine relies on some key packages developed by some of the other panelists here. Uh, Raster and RGDAL, of course, among many other applications, uh, one of the really nice features of these packages is they allow format agnostic access to Raster files. Um, memory map, uh, MMAP, there's also, I think, Big Memory is a similar package, uh, allows us to do things like parallel uh, and asynchronous writing to a single file, which can help with parallel writes, which is kind of tricky uh, with raster processing. And then, of course, uh, for each, which I don't know if some of you have talked about, but this is a kind of, uh, in the same way that raster and RGDAL are, allow format agnostic access to raster files, for, for each allows uh, cluster infrastructure agnostic uh, access to parallel computing. So it allows you to use backbones like Snow, uh, the parallel package, multi-core, RMPI, things like that. Um, so next slide. Just really briefly, raster engine, I was really trying to bring down the bar of entry for my students. Um, so basically all you do is you use, uh, you start a parallel cluster. Um, you can do that in any way. As long as it's registered with four each, it's fine. You write your function, uh, and the function really just takes a, the array in, uh, treats each raster input uh, from the perspective of the function. It's just an array. There's other formats you can pass it on. So you write your function, uh, and then you can see the step three is the actual implementation of raster engine, where you just feed it which rasters uh, go into the function. Uh, you tell it what function to use, and then it runs on a multi-core system, and then you shut down the parallel engine uh, afterwards. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to kind of, I guess, finalize this, uh, and I'll, I'll make one other comment. I don't have, I wrote an additional slide, but you guys don't have it. But uh, just a couple pieces of perspective. I think uh, one of the things we need to be thinking of when we're implementing high-performance computing uh, for GIS is we really need to lower the cost of entry. Um, I would not assume your users uh, know anything about parallel processing. So as much as you can take that out of their worry uh, or remove the worry from their perspective of that and put it into the code that's going to benefit uh, everyone. Um, so implementing these high performance com uh, capabilities behind the scenes, uh, particularly in system agnostic parallel computing packages where they can run on any, uh, any infrastructure. Uh, if a person has a single computer or a cluster computer, uh, there are ways primarily with for each to kind of make it work on all of them. Um, and I kind of mentioned the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. Um, I don't really want to talk about that. So uh, if you can kind of shut down the slides, I guess my last kind of note, and this is really moving towards uh, what I kind of see as larger needs, um, is that it's relatively easy to do parallel. There's, this is not a slide. Uh, there's no slide on this one. Um, I'm reading off my notes, so I've added one. Uh, one of the one of the things that's a real challenge uh, is vector processing at this point. Raster processing in a parallel manner is not too hard to do. It's 
harder to do really efficiently, but it's, I mean, you pretty much raster, you take an image, break it up into chunks, send them to different cores, and then you got to have, there's some tricks with that, but it's not too hard to do uh, raster processing in parallel, but vector parallelization is much more complicated, um, particularly in memory safe processing. And so I kind of was curious, can we use existing technologies and link it into our uh, post GIS and spatial light as backbones? Um, uh, I know that there, there's a couple of uh, efforts, uh, Stato and Postgres XC allow for parallel uh, processing, primarily of post-GIS. Um, they seem to be pretty, uh, they're not ready to go, it doesn't seem yet, unless we, or maybe someone has more experience with that. Um, also with uh, getting GPU processing going, of course, CUDA has a lot of issues with versioning and licensing issues. Um, so there's some issues there, and also uh, the other kind of note I wrote to myself is, and this goes along with the trying to rem remove the, the challenge of HPC from the end user and move it into the developer's perspective is uh, kind of working up auto-tuning of parallel processing techniques where your process can adjust based on its local infrastructure. Anyway, that's it. That's my battle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... So you get a picture of the audience very briefly. Thank you. I've whizzed past you. Break my coffee. And so now I'll ask uh, some of some of the people at this this side to perhaps give some reflections. They don't need to address the points you've taken up. We can we can iterate round that. But uh, who, who would like to, to kick off? Uh, if anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, Hi, Jonathan. So I'm, I'm Ed Sir. So a question I had is uh, with, with sort of the amounts of data that you mentioned that we will all need to sort of work on in a couple of years, um, and, and uh, knowing that uh, the Matt Hansen science paper actually was carried out in the Google Cloud, so do you see that we in the future uh, still have to first download all these, each of us has to download all of these data to, to our own clusters and then process them? or should we work towards some kind of, uh, uh, you know, shared infrastructure where you basically bring the computations to the data? And, 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 and if that is a perspective, how would that look like? So, I mean, does anybody else want to respond? Or I can respond briefly to that. Um, any, any I, I think one of the problems is that uh, our data sets, a lot of, well, well, in GIS, we tend to use data sets from a lot of different sources. So to some extent, I can see... Uh, we're still going to have to be moving these data sets around. Uh, it's going to be, I mean, tying into multiple uh, data systems is going to be kind of a, a pretty significant challenge. We're usually not processing one data set. So, you know, one of the things that Google was able to do, the reason they were able to use their own system, well, first of all, they did have to get all the data to their, their infrastructure, but they were really only using one data set. Um, and a lot of GIS is using a lot of different data sets together. So I don't know how to really, uh, how you would do that in an efficient manner. Okay. What do you think? So, so, so it's a, a pause for thinking. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it, it remains a problem, right? So. Uh, yeah. So if, if if we get into you know into Sentinel volumes, which is what 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 did they say one terabyte per day or something like that will come down. Yeah. Uh, it won't it won't work anymore, right? So that's too much. For the network, so you need to you need to kind of rethink where you, where to compute then if you want to analyze these data, and and I don't think that a lot of uh, sort of clever answers have come up so far. Can I persuade the two of you to join in? Possibly. Um, this is Barry Rollins. Hi, John. Uh, have we met before? Were you? At, I don't know. Were you at our conference in Nashville? At it. No, I wasn't at that one. Yeah, we sorry. Um, Were you playing the guitar there? Beyond the beyond the chit chat, um, I'm just wondering whether any of the OGC standard web processing service um, systems might be a way of, of if, if Google were using if Google had a WPS interface for their processing systems, we'd have a, a more of a cross platform. We wouldn't be tied to the Google's underlying systems if we had an open standard processing system for online web processing. Well, that's, that thought's just kind of occurred to me because some of the guys here were dissing Google and saying, hey, if Google switched this engine off, you know, we're stuck. 
No. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a guy, uh, there's a researcher at my university, Xiaowen Wang, who's kind of, he's a cyber GIS. Uh, he's one of the inventors of cyber GIS, and I think they're working towards that. But the standardization of, I mean, good luck, I mean, look at the GDAL formats, and you're asking about standardization of uh, infrastructure. Yeah, um, it would be nice. <laughs> Well, I think that the WPS API is is getting standardized in some way, but it should be possible to advertise a service that does something via a stand interface. Mm -hmm. And then you can you can make that work on a small data set on running as a back end on your machine. Mm -hmm. Great, my, my classification works and now I can do the whole earth on Google in ten minutes and if Google switch themselves off, some other supplier will come up and, and act and and be able to, to feed that demand if, if the demand is there. So, I mean, cross-platform solutions are always good, aren't they? Hi, Jonathan. Um, I, I, I think I agree with everything you've said. Um, the Google example that Etzer brought up is interesting, but of course what they do is parallel processing, right? Lots of small tiles, over thousands of computers, they can very quickly do these things. So it's a, if anything, it, it, it reinforces your points. Um, I talked about this, I had a presentation yesterday and I, I said a couple of things about uh, parallel processing. Um, maybe the most important one being if you think you need it, you're wrong, um, generally. It's not, that's not your case, but I, I just, just make it, there's many ways in, in R in which we can improve speed and often just being a, a, a smarter script that can be 10. 100-fold yes, speed increase. Um, in the case of the roster package, but I suppose it also holds for vector processing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the design of those packages could be much improved still. Um, and so there's a lot of other ways as well to get, get uh, uh, speed increases, but that's just additional to what you said. Um, uh, not, 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 to, um, not to disagree with that at all. And, and I very much agree with the, the notion that, that, uh, that the more we can um, hide the complexity and build this in, uh, the better we are. Which you've done a really great job with with Raster, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but more can be done. Anyone in the audience that um, is totally lost and wants to, you don't have to explain everything again? Now in now in English, right. we have we have a very good group, but, but of course some people are, are just starting with R and, and probably didn't get all the details. Other people are very experienced. Um, some of them have worked quite a bit with mode, uh, with satellite images and have been asking questions about speeding things up. We had a discussion about Python, rather using Python maybe for certain things. What's, what's your perspective on that? So why not just do do some Python programming for for those kind of things? Why don't you, why you stick with R? So uh, I was a uh... I was at um, this big data conference where we were specifically talking about R for big data and uh, oh, what am I forgetting and saying, Who, who's uh, the Debian package manager is also the RSIG HPC guy? Etobudol. Who? Pierre Etobudol. Yeah, that's it. Um, so he was there and somebody asked him that question and he almost bit their head off about uh, the Python versus R. I mean, I think I, I think the, the reason why a lot of us use R and came to R is that it's it's a... It's a language written for analysts. It's not a language written for computer scientists. So it is by no stretch of the imagination. I mean, if you want to go the most efficient, then write everything in C. And good luck getting being productive in research if you're spending all your time writing C code. So I think that um, you know we have a trade-off, and I think we can develop a lot more quickly, uh, particularly with GIS. I mean, do you get the feeling that Python support of GIS is anywhere near as advanced as what we've got in R? I heard it's eight years behind. Yeah. Sorry, somebody yesterday said it was eight years behind. Oh, yeah, that, was, that may be optimistic, but, but it's, yeah. it's far behind. Yeah, and so we speed up our development time, but the efficiency, of course, is not really there. And some of that's our fault. Some of that's you know the core R approach. I mean, it, the the data model, and this is one of the things, is that the data model uh, is load all the data into memory and process it that way, and that's been the background for R. And that's you know, I mean. And that's one of the things I thought we might want to talk about is, is particularly the vector model is that it, it, we need to be able to scale these things 
and the in memory, it's easy to do that with raster. It's it's really hard to do that uh, with vector data. This sort of getting away from the in memory concept. What I, I think in principle it's very straightforward. It just has oh. to be done. But it, it, so you could have the very the very the, the, the very same principles. You have a pointer towards a, a file resource or however it's stored. But you mentioned the database, and then you and then you extract features one by one or as, as groups. I mean, that's, there's really no reason for not doing it that way, and that's how you would do it with OGR in, in Python. And I, and I tried this one. Well, you go ahead, Barry. Um, yeah, I, I tried. I tried um, doing this many, many years ago with this R maps package, which which I did, which was a precursor to the SP stuff that we did, and it did exactly that. It, it kept uh, the name of the shape file, and then only when you actually requested features did it actually get the features from it. And you could subset, if, and and it kept a record of the subset of the records, and it, it worked quite nicely. But then we came and and Roger decided that SP was a good idea, and we stored everything in memory, and that was all those years ago. So we, we kind of fell back on that in memory, fell back to that in, in memory concept. But yeah, maybe it's coming around full circle now that we've got huge vector data. Yeah. So I mean, one of the issues with PostGIS is that it's really hard to set up. So for an end user, it's oh, it's not that hard. Yeah, no, it is. I'm saying, yeah, that's that's yeah. really not a no-go uh, option for a. I mean, does anybody on the panel or out in the audience have it, uh, you know, spatial light? Has that been looked into at all? Because it's a lot easier, at least, to set up. And I think it has a lot of the same calls as PostGIS. Um, yeah, I can say a little bit about it. That spatial light has also been discussed in the context of this new OTC thing. Um, what was it called? The, the data storage kind of, data storage kind of the, the thing that but yeah, that should package, geo package yeah. right? That should on, okay. it should run on mobile phones and so on. Uh, as basically as a sort of a follow up on uh, shape files, yeah. um, and um, and that sounds that sounds useful. At least there were some questions about the stability of the whole thing, availability, the dependence on a single developer, and so on. The usual kind of uh, uh, what are the weak points of the of the project? But the approaches, I think, is very is very good, and uh, it would be you know fairly trivial to because it's it's also SQL for features for simple features to to have solutions that both work on PostGIS as well as on SQLite data and SQLite files. Right? So it, it, I mean, if you do one, then basically the other one comes for free. I would say because it's the same the same API. More or less, right? Slightly. SQL. Minor, minor bit. SQL. Um, and but um, but is it, is, I mean, do you think? Do you really think? Could you give an example where the uh, vector or the feature data sets they, where you work with are really so large that they don't? I mean, you know, laptops nowadays come with sixteen gigabytes of memory where they don't fit oh. in anymore. I'll give you a really good example, one that's actually coming out of our research. So one of the things that we do is uh, individual tree crown mapping. So what we do is we take a remotely sensed data set, either LIDAR or hyperspatial, something like Worldview 2, and we run a bunch of com uh, computer vision techniques on it. And we are, we, are pull we are creating vectors of every single tree crown in a very large data set. And then we want to go from that and start querying things about the tree size and spatial relationships between the trees. I mean, these are million. I mean, these are getting into the millions to billions of vectors, and so that's a. I mean, that of course it can be tiled. I mean, that's one of the ways at least lidar deals with the problem. But that's that would be a. I mean, we we are the reason I've been paying attention to the vector parallel processing is because I know that's coming down the line with my research. Is that we're going to start producing these gigantic vector data sets, and what do we do with them? We can't use shape files for those. I mean, we'd have a shape file, you know, a million shape files because we keep running into its limitations. So that would just be an example. And LIDAR is another thing, but LIDAR has got its own, I mean, there's been a lot of development in LIDAR vector processing, but you don't really treat it the same way we do most GIS data. It's kind of this weird hybrid of raster and vector processing. Right, they so. have their own sort of uh, strong engineering oriented uh, approaches, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, uh, make a, this is Roger, 
Uh, can I make a... Uh, show my head. I'm, I'm round the corner trying to keep things running. Uh, the, as you said, the reason for keeping, keeping things in, uh, in memory was because as a system for statistical data analysis. Yep. Now, we have a problem here with the population and the sample. And to what extent, in order to reach inferences, to what extent do we need to have the population? So, so what, what extra information is being given with regard to drawing inferences about the problem of interest from big data? So I'm not necessarily big data skeptic, but I can understand people who are. I, I have talked talk to others about this, and there are cases where you really need to have enormous data sets in order to find the outlier, and it's the outlier you're interested in. It's, it's some very odd event, so you want a lot of, uh, of seismic data in order to pick out the traces before a, uh, an earthquake or something like that. So you have to process lots of data to get out the one very specific event, and you'll find some of the same things with, with extreme precipitation events and other things like that. And you find things like this on the social science side as well, that, that there are many diseases which are very, very, very sel seldom found, so that you do need big data to get at them. But if we're using big data to answer questions which we could answer with small data, uh, is, that, is, that, is looking at big data diverting our interest from the fact that we could answer the same inferential problem by using slightly smarter sampling? I mean, it's going to depend on the application, right? I mean, I can give you some more examples from my own research. I mean, one of the things we do with the tree crowns is we're looking for mortality events. And so we actually do the tree crown recognition over two time periods, and we're looking for, and these are, you know, we're basically looking for areas where there was a polygon at one time and not a polygon in the other. And these mortality events are fractions of a percent of the total population. So that's one example. And then other examples, uh, like what you were pointing out, is uh, applications of quantile regression. Where you're looking at the extreme of a, dis, of a you know of a scatter plot, not the central tendencies, and those are really data poor areas. And you know, climate change research in general is looking at or climate change uh, impacts on ecosystems. Uh, we see the most profound profound effects kind of at the extrema of the distributions. And so I you know, and that was just an example from my own research. I mean, I think. We should be going at, yes, I agree that if you can do it with a smaller sample size, you should. But I think there's, we're seeing a lot of examples where you really need a large data sets to look for these little events or these rare events or these uh, data poor regions of a distribution, the tails of a distribution where we're trying to make inferences, uh, that we really need gigantic data sets to quantify those. Yeah, I would add that, that, that it, it really sort of, Describes your background and your interest and your work, right? And and, and but but if you take that um, deforestation work with all these Landsat images, was it sixty-four thousand? What was the number? And so there is an attempt. So you could say, well, just take a sample and then generalize. Yep. Um, and it's and you probably uh, now if you wanted to know the deforestation rates globally, you you probably get very close to it very soon. Um, I guess. Well, so so but, but but I guess yeah. what, what, what they're after is to say, well, we just want to, as close as possible, exactly say where it happens, not have just a general global number, but we want to identify X, X, every specific pixel. And there's something to say for that, because then you can look at where that is. And, and so it's a different type of analysis, um, often more related to modeling and, and taking then these deforestation places further. And, and, and so you could do a sample, but I, I guess there's something to say for to try to do everything. But. Can I, uh, so a colleague of mine here is, isn't here, he's an economist, but he's an environmental economist and he's looking at deforestation. Um, so you can't see me, but I'm just around the corner. Uh, and what he, you don't need to, you don't need to move oh, yes. it because you have to move it back again. Okay, so, so, so now you can see <laughs> some. <laughs> I can you see can, a reflection you, in the door over there. Yeah, you can, you can, you can see the door. Uh, so what, what, what he's doing is taking the border between, uh, between Uganda and uh, DR Congo and taking a buffer on either side and looking at changes along the buffer in order to distinguish policy effects. So, so in a country which is better governed 
compared to a country which is not governed, do you see differences? And he's seeing differences, but he's doing it by adopting a sampling scheme, which means that he doesn't have to process lots of information, but still reaches a useful inferential conclusion. So that my, uh, my argument, both as in, in, in terms of research, uh, but also in terms of trying to reach uh, policy-relevant handles, so that handling, so dealing with large, big data, does that necessarily give us policy handles? If it gives, it gives us a policy handle, then that's great. But I'm not always sure that it does. So that, uh, that given the fact that we've got, um, uh, so of course, I'm being devil's advocate here because I'm very pleased sure. that you, your packages have arrived. But we've got lots of people here who don't necessarily have access to the kinds of resources uh, that, um, that, 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 say, in North America or in Europe, one might have access to. Because we've got people here from everywhere. And you can actually get a long way with uh, paper and pencil intelligence and a laptop. Uh, is, is that fair? Yeah, but it, there is, there are problems that cannot be solved with on a laptop. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't be investing. I mean, it, it, that's not to say you can't do good science without a supercomputer, but there are specific challenges out there that we, I mean, you know, getting back to, to climate change research, I mean, uh, red monitoring. Um, when we're when we're monitoring for carbon emissions from forests, um, I, I, to my knowledge, you can't interpolate. You know, if, you, if you're trying to get some sort of credit on your property for planting or not chopping down trees, you're not allowed to say, "Well, my neighbor didn't chop down his trees. My neighbor on the other side didn't chop down his tree." So. By interpolating between the two, I didn't chop down my trees. You have to monitor the entire landscape. And so, I mean, that's a policy problem right there, and this is one of the challenges. So, yes, you can, I mean, obviously you can do great research with a pen and paper, but there are specific problems uh, that can only be solved with big data. Um, and those are, you know, some of the things that we need to wrestle with. So, so to, to, as I said, I was being devil's advocate. I'm, I, sure. I, I'm just sort of saying that there are there are alternatives. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the goals that you have with the packages which you've been contributing are to try and make it easier for people who aren't computer scientists to actually right. apply these things. Yeah, that that would be fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the whole thing. I mean, that's that's just an an issue of making it easier for, I mean, the GDAL utils, the whole reason I developed that package was to give people easy access to HDF files on Windows. That was the whole reason I, I developed that pack. I mean, it was fine, it's, it, now it's a wrapper for all the GDAL utilities, but the main thing was was to make uh, uh, Landsat and MODIS data accessible to people on Windows boxes, which is most, I mean, a lot of people that are doing these analyses, they're working on Windows. Um, so that was, uh, so just making things easier for people, uh, I think is a really important thing, uh, challenge, or goal. Should we try and bring in somebody from the audience? Okay, so if you take the mic there and we'll... Hi, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Dirk Finn. I'm at the University of Oregon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. in the middle. Uh, I've been looking at uh, taking a step backwards and looking at uh, how the basic fundamentals of um, space and time are connected. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at uh, how um, you can try to find other ways uh, than using raster and vector like we're doing today and find other methods and, and other data types and how uh, they are stored. And one of the things I'm trying to look at now is uh, um, area um, Array-based databases, so we have multiple area uh, array. Uh, so we are ending up with with type of 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 of, uh, of uh, um, vertex systems. So you have addressing all the things. Um, would that really be a way to solve any problem that you are addressing with with a, with a vector system? Do you have a day? Do you think that could be a way to solve around that problem? So describe your technique again. Uh, using vectors in five. Answer that question, I, think. I think you should answer, answer that question. No, I, 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 I try. I, I, I try to answer that question, but I, but I also have to 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 hear what people who is working with big data today is uh, experience of problems. 
uh, when they try to process vector data. But uh, because I, I, I'm believing, uh, like, I think most like do, that the big data is go grow. Uh, There's going to be more and more data set that has a large amount of data in them, and we can't ignore them. Some of the cases uh, we can do, like Roger says, we can, we can go back and sample in a better way and, and try to solve it because we don't want to step into large data set without uh, testing out that we, are, we can solve the way, this problem in another way. Uh, so what I'm I, I, uh, looking into is, uh, if, if, is uh, another way to combine both vector and raster in one uh, data system. And if you could do that, you can actually, uh, and able to implement that, you can go the way down uh, the road that, that the CERN have gone uh, where they're collecting uh, with a couple of large data centers around the world where the owners of the data actually um, collect full sets uh, so scientists can go in and process them like, uh, like you said, uh, you have certain owners of data today and which they take responsibility also to replicate their data between them uh, in a couple of, of three, four places, uh, you no longer have to move the data uh, but you can actually process them. But then you have to standardize in, at the bottom where, how these data are organized. Uh, in that perspective, uh, can you see any way that you can organize data um, uh, so you can, you can actually efficient, make a more efficient way to process vector data? This is, I'm throwing this out, out, my expertise is in a raster, so I throw this back to you. Um, I mean, one of the things with space-time data, I was curious how much people that are working with spatiotemporal data in, in particular, because those are weird data, I mean, you're right, there's a lot of different ways, I mean, even the, the space-time package itself has, what, four different ways of uh, storing space-time data. Have, those of you that have worked with space-time data, have you looked towards the LIDAR community who deal with these hybrids? Uh, for any inspirations on how to how to uh, structure these data as a uh, query. Mm. No, for the, for the what, what I would say is that uh, the way we are computing now. Earlier, we we, we do a lot of modeling, uh, and now it actually I see it, we see a tendency that that modelings are working working more into using real life data because the data is there. We don't have to model in it to a large extent. We, we measure it. But, before, before we, 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 we try to process it. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it, it's a very hard task, and I, I can see why, why you are struggling with, with, with the vector thing, and uh, particularly when you try to combine it with Rasta and, uh, and that stuff. So, I mean, again, we've, the person in my department, Xiaowen Wang, he's, the, he's working on these challenges. Uh, he's also working on larger infrastructure challenges of these kind of data centers where you essentially submit a function to the data center and it runs on these large hybrid data sets. So um, I would kind of direct you to some of, I mean, I can also, I can email uh, Roger some of the uh, papers, but I think there are people working on these cyber GIS problems. They're not really in the R community, but they are in the open source community um, mm -hmm. that are work, that are actively working on these. I'm a plant ecologist, so I, I can't spend two years working on trying to speed up a vector process. Um, I'm just hoping that one of you out there uh, might be able to come up with these uh, efficiencies. So. Okay, thank you. So I can say it. So, uh, yes, so that I'm being responsible for uh, space time, I can say yep. a few words. Uh, so, there, um, so space time is on the agenda of tomorrow. So I'm, I'm a bit a little bit speaking before my turn. Um, it it came actually up because there was I was being asked to tell to it was invited to give a lecture in Brazil about <laughs> what we can do with spatial temporal data in R uh, at an early enough stage to you know to come up with something because the answer was basically we can't do anything. It's a mess. Uh, it's pure ad hoc and so on. Um, so I did a, a few sort of exercises to, to do useful uh, stuff with differently organized data. Um, what I see in the remote sensing community is, is basically that you have, you know, you have large, too large data to sort of to, to work in memory. Uh, so that package is not very useful. Um, 
but it's useful to try out things and to uh, to prototype things. And what I at the same time what I see at the uh, in in the in the community in the remote sensing community is that there is very little there are very little initiatives to to deal with this data in a clever way. In the sense that everyone uh, everyone is shouting Hadoop, and Hadoop yep. is not a solution for high dimensional arrays, right? Yep. So it might be a back end, but it's you, you have to think very cleverly. Um, we are doing experiments with CIDB in the, in the, at this moment, and it's you know it is hard work. It is uh, it's not easy, yep. but it is it is promising. It has a couple of I good ideas, and in particular, it allows you to um, you know to compute to compute. Are to execute our programs on the sort of on the low level in the in the in the worker nodes. Uh, so that's that's an uh, that's an idea. It is, by the way, a very different uh, uh, architecture because it's a shared uh, a shared nothing architecture. So it doesn't do the mem the M map. It doesn't require the M map sort of tricks that you uh, that you are uh, uh, exploiting. Um, I, my feeling is, but but that I, it, it's a large area that I don't completely oversee because it's it's it just not, you know it's too much work. My feeling is that the uh, um, the statistical models that are being used uh, to find to detect changes in in remote sensing uh, image time series are at a very early stage of development. Yeah, so they're quite often they're pure time series models looking for breaks or something like that. Where a pixel time series is being analyzed and then uh, being forgotten when the neighbor pixel is is on, on, on turn, mm. basically. So it is again you're looking at a one-dimensional problem in a, in a in a sort of non-spatial way, right? So so there's a lot to there's quite a lot to do there. And if you want to do it in a more clever way, then uh, automatically problems grow, right? I mean, doing this in this way, uh, Hadoop might be enough. Right? But the answer is doing it in a different way, where where I'll do it much more difficult. Yeah, I mean, and remote sensing gives it makes it even more complicated because what you actually see in the remote sensing community is that uh, they'll essentially do a single band transform in DBI uh, and just stack everything. So, and then they'll basically run the time series pixel by pixel. But that's actually throwing a ton of data away because, of course, remote sensing is not just producing a single NDVI measurement. I mean, you've got MODIS with what is it at fifty bands? Of information, each of uh, you know, that are some of which are correlated with one another, but some of them may be carrying very, very different uh, pieces of information. And so now you've got space, time, spe and then you add in the spectral component, and no one's, as far as I know, been looking at that. Right, they're throwing away the data. Right, it's all single yep. pixel, single band inference, yep. and then, and that's it at this moment. And NDVI is limited use in a lot of cases. So. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, Jonathan, this is uh, Tom Hengel. Um, we also know we never met, uh, unfortunately. And uh, first of all, thank you for doing this uh, webinar. I, I, I'm not sure how much uh, what's the time in the uh, U.S. But, oh, it's uh, easy. It's lunchtime. It's 11.30. Uh, I, did, I did also a few webinars, and once I actually forgot about it, and then I had to improvise. Uh, so it's always the, the thing with the time zones, which is frustrating. So here's a hypothetical question. Uh, if I could give you half a million dollar, and... It's not, it's not too much money. I mean, it's only like 300-something thousand euros. Uh, so if you, could, uh, if you could put, if I will give it, so that's like uh, three Google Research scholarships. And I give you that money to develop software. Okay, so how would you spend it? What, what would you do for it? Oh, you're talking about uh, specifically doing the tree crown mapping or? No, so I give you money to develop software. Oh. Half million dollars. <laughs> now you have, so you have lots of money, you can hire a programmer, so you can just tell them, I want this, this, and this. Tom, I need to answer that. <laughs> Go for it. No, you don't fight for the money. Uh, the, sorry, the, the, I've, I've jumped in again. Uh, in, in our communities, the problem isn't money. The problem is insight. Uh, so most of us don't have enough time to think, I think. I think it's obviously I don't, obviously obviously I don't have enough time to think because because uh, uh, so that was the, that was what I explained that that the uh, that the um, taking taking time to think about data representations to think about support to think about inference um, in order to get to cleverer smarter solutions seems to be important. And then perhaps we can design the data collection in a in a in a in a in a in a, 
uh, more targeted way. So we're, we, we, we have a perhaps a theory-based uh, question, and then we ask, uh, we ask how, can, how can we answer this and which kinds of data do we need to collect? Because very often we find that the, it's the data collection which then drives the analysis, and then there are interesting questions we'd like answered, uh, which we can't answer because we don't have the data, and the only data there are are the data which we collect. So that my, my, my example from, from Fisher's re research here from 10 years ago was, was, was the, 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 um, the oceanographic data were collected at different times and places from the fisheries data, and then the GIS people were given the two different data sets and asked, well, make sense of this, you. And, and, uh, but if you'd thought about the data collection first, you would remove the need, as, as the statisticians would say, you can condition on, because you're collecting the data at the same place and the same time. You're not involved in making assumptions that things are invariant in space and time when you know that they aren't. So that, that I think we need m a little more time to think, and one of the advantages of meetings like this is that we get together and we, we have time to think. We have coffee breaks, we have lunch breaks, and, well, the participants have plots to do all of the time, but that's, that's, <coughs> the, that's the name of the game. Uh, perhaps I'd like to encourage somebody else, unless, some, unless Tom wants to get back at me. No, I wanted to give Gary half a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, he doesn't need it. But, but, no, but, but I mean, you, 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 can answer, you can answer the question if you like. My, my sort of trump is that money isn't, isn't the question. The question is, is time. Uh, and time also doesn't give you money. Because, because you, need, you need to be able to think about things. Roger, Roger, half a million buys you a lot of thinking time. <laughs> no, but I was, I was just you, thinking you more like if you have to prioritize, so you have to say, look, like we have a, which are really the bottlenecks of, um, you know, doing research and doing, ex uh, so doing a high quality research, which are really bottlenecks? Is it, is it um, um, you know, spatial databases and uh, serving processes? Is it um, uh, having the right uh, um, structures and classes for data? Is it? Uh, having the uh, extending the analytics we have to you know from some spatial geostatistics to special temporal geostatistics you know wh wh where would you put where would you put your bet i mean that's that's what i wanted to ask well i mean you can uh, let me answer a little bit because i just put in a grant uh for doing some some research about 20 actually i'm getting a lot of panicked emails probably about why i haven't signed some forms but um you know, I, I think one of the challenges with uh, that we have right now is that a lot of the people that are work, that are on the panel, not everybody, but, uh, well, actually, I, I don't know everybody's background, but I'm guessing most people are not computer scientists that are coming, that are asking these questions. Um, the computer scientists are going to be best able to solve the problems, but they don't know how to, they don't know enough about the field. And so you really need some good collaborative groups you know, you've got the people, the end users like me that are, you know, we're, t you know, attempting to do parallel processing, but I'm not an ex I'm not a computer scientist. I'm just doing my best to try to speed up the process a little bit. Um, you need some good collaborative groups that where you can have people that are really fluent in computer science that can talk to the people that are that need to use the data to set up the problem in the first place. Um, so I I found my the most productive work I've done. Uh, in advancing these problems is working with computer scientists where I say, okay, this is the challenge that I have. I don't have the expertise or really the time uh, to solve these really efficiently, but I know that my problem is not unique. It's, you know, raster processing. Like Lots of people need raster processing. Um, and solving that, uh, speeding that up and allowing people to do more advanced analyses without requiring a lot more expertise um, uh, you know, it's a real challenge. I mean, you can slap together uh, an, an optimized code to make it usable by people. That's really hard. Um, and so kind of at the junk, you know, don't give me a half million dollars. Give me uh, 250000 to set up the problem and give a computer scientist 250000 to answer it. So that would be my answer to it. Okay. Somebody else like wants to spend some money? Programmers will solve all this. Is it? No. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I can. So uh, I can comment a little bit uh, on that on that one. So the computer scientists, uh, it it is it is not so easy to sort of find computer scientists who can solve your problems, right? By by implementing. 
so this is a challenge. So, so we, you know, we teach students as the informaticians, so being half geosciences, half computer programmers, right. and 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 even you know that is that is challenging. But it it, it sounds like you know uh, getting you know defining a problem such a way that an arbitrary good computer programmer can sort of go sit down and implement things is is sort of much harder than you think. So so you really want the people who understand the problems and can code. I think. Yep. Uh, could I, in the last quarter of an hour that we have here, ask for whether, other the, uh, whether there are other questions for, from the audience? Yes. So can you take the camera? Yes. If you come a bit closer to the camera, then... Okay, it's... The, 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 mic, the mic that Jonathan here... It's really... The Hi. <laughs> oh. Uh, my name is Ma. I come from um, Aarhus University in Denmark. I'm originally Chinese, you can see. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I just have a, a very non-technical question because I, I'm new to it. I'm an end user. So as an end user, I want to know something uh, if I can do in the future. Say, if there is an R package, I can use it to write a piece of app, and then I can upload it to my personal blog, ask people to download it, and to do the distributed computing for my some big data set project, do, do, do you picture that day coming? I mean, can I really do that? Then that opens a lot of, a hell lot of opportunities to do things. Everybody can make their own analysis big. So that's my question, thank you. Don't go away, don't go away. Did, did you hear? Yeah, you're asking, can you write a package and then make it available to everybody? Um, so? No. <laughs> um, just yeah, let me explain. Um, just like the SETI web page, you can download something. The SETI, the search for the alien web page. You, yeah. yeah. So you can download some program from SETI. Then you're basically doing computing using your spare computational power of your own laptop. Okay. So if you can do that, you can write something like that, and you can ask people to download it from your own web blog. Oh, you're talking about Boink, mm -hmm. the Berkeley Open Infrastructure Network Computing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, every, other people can answer this. That works on very specific types of analyses, basically things where you're not transmitting huge amounts of data to the end user, and then, that, and then the actual process, I mean, the computation of the chunks has to be way much more computationally costly than that transfer time because you're losing a lot. I mean, you're chunking out a piece of data and then you're having to send it over, you know, God knows what sort of uh, network. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, has nobody written a Boink thing for R? I thought somebody had at some point, but... Yeah, so, I mean, it's... you Go go ahead, do it, write it. Um, but it's, it's that sort of processing is only good for very specific types of analyses. Just be aware of that. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? Or are, are we all beginning to be done? <laughs> you've been working hard. Yesterday it was a 12 hour day, today is pretty long too. So I think we're about to, ready to, 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 to wrap up. But be, be, before we finish, then, then uh, would you like to say something, Truk? No, it's okay. So I just uh, I just point the camera at a truck who will wave at you. So can you wa you wave at wave at him? As you remember that you asked on one occasion, how do you stop processes on Windows, parallel processes on Windows? That was that was truck who answered. Oh, excellent. Okay, so that you 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 know so that there are people in Bergen who do things, but most much of his work is is actually in in parallel processing, uh, medical analysis. So that that's, Excellent. Yeah. Okay. But so that there sure. are the, the and the, so that the point of uh, sort of getting truck to wave is that quite often other sciences have been there, and so that some some within the R community, it's enough to try and look a little bit broader, like the uh, HCP list, and then sometimes someone on the HP, uh, HPC list, like Dick has been there before, know, knows about it, uh, and so that there are, there are other possibilities there. Uh, but when, when we get to a situation that we can actually swallow all of the data which is being produced, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, well, 
we may live to see it. We may. Uh, any 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 uh, points in summary to, to, to finish up? Well, we won't live to see that because the amount of data is increasing at a much faster rate than we can process it. But, which we, but, it be, but it's nice to try to keep up. I think and I think it's important. Yeah. I think. Would you like to say something, Chuck? Or, or, or see if you take the, the mic up. Uh, hello, everybody. I, um, from my experience, I am uh, agree with Jonathan about the, uh, the most important thing is you, you go into this course when you get back home. And most of the time, let's say 80, 90% of the time, you use to clean the data. So uh, my experience is why don't you talk to, let's say, some IT computer expert Talk to a lot of people around. It's just like in my uh, in my job. So we have a lot of uh, database experts. We have a statistician. We have a lot of people. So we start to make something very simple. Let's say we make some kind of um, um, some application with the uh, ESC, so everybody can come in and to make some analysis and start from that, and everybody from different um, uh, kind of views can contribute to, let's see, how to solve the big data analysis, how to run the parallel processing, and etc. cetera, et cetera. So I think as, uh, the important thing is not only uh, to receive the knowledge, but how to know the best from database. What can I use from database? What can I use from R? What can I use from other kind of uh, visualization? in order to shorten your process and more effective to, to make things. Thank you. That was, I assume, that was a comment, no? That was, wasn't a question. You just wanted yeah. to comment. Okay. Okay. Since I have a microphone also, I would like to ask you something. If we would like to thank you for this webinar, maybe in person, uh, so, what, what is the best chance to take you uh, for this webinar in person? I mean, what are the conferences or meetings you're going to attend in the next year or this year? Do you have some conference that you would like to recommend to this audience? AGU. AGU? Okay. So, so looking AGU. forward to see you there, Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for the webinar, and uh, we're looking forward to meeting you, whether on a conference or maybe on the next Geostat. We'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Excellent. And uh, yeah, good, uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, okay, bye-bye. 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 American Geophysical Union, which has an annual meeting in San Francisco every year. Okay, so I think we are finished. I hope you found that interesting. It's a bit sort of uh, blue sky, but uh, I think it went very well, right? It's, it's, it was good. The bandwidth is getting better and better.